Deuteronomy, a, a Greek word meaning the second law, only there is no such thing as second law. I like to call it a repeat of the law by Moses rather than a Levitical priest giving and speaking in priestly terms. That can be difficult for a lay person to understand, but Moses lays it out whereby anyone can understand it. So I particularly love this book of Deuteronomy, and of course, uh, and, and I prefer the uh, Hebrew name, which is to say, these are the words, which would be El uh, Had Abarim in the Hebrew tongue. These are the words. They're the words you can live by. It will tell you before we finish the book how you can better get along with your family, how you can better get along in your community, and uh, just give you a good overall general outlook on life, but more than just an outlook, it tells you how to do it. And that's important because it's advice from your Heavenly Father that you can't go too wrong on now. We have the Israelites who have wandered in the wilderness for 38 years are now going into the Promised Land. The book of Deuteronomy was written probably about 30 days before Moses' death. And um, if we can say death or transfiguration, whatever the case might have been, we're crossing from the Sinai. We're crossing below south and on the south end of, let's say, the Dead Sea. And we're crossing to the east side of the Dead Sea. And we're going to march up the east side of the Dead Sea to Mount Nebo, where, where uh, Moses ultimately in this book will depart from Israel and Joshua will take over. But on that side of the river, we learned some very good lessons for Moab and uh, his brother, the children of Lot, controlled a great deal of this land, but on kind of the northern end of the Dead Sea, there's some very rich soil in there. And a great warrior, Sihon, which means warrior in their tongue, had uh, run um, the um, Moab south from there, taking the land from them. And, but God stipulated, don't bother Ammon and Moab. Leave them alone. Lot's son, uh, offspring, uh, the offspring thereof by his own family. So we're moving north. Uh, on the east side of the Dead Sea, which puts us on the east side of Jordan, if you understand, when we come up on Jordan. Having said that, God, rather than telling as he did with Esau, he said, don't bother their land, don't bother Moab's land. But he said, go in and completely annihilate Sihon and his people. You want to remember there still is a remnant not of the giants themselves with the case with the exception of one or two left alive in the country but the intermixing of it god wanted it destroyed that's why he had the flood in the first place and this was the second influx a little difficult for a christian to understand unless you realize it is something that was contrary to the plan of salvation that god had set for his people because there were mines that were not born innocent of woman, but had observed and even knowledge of the first earth age. Having said that, Moses sends a word of, by an ambassador telling Sihon, let us through peacefully. God didn't seem to resent that. Sihon won't allow it as we pick it up today in chapter 2, verse 30, a word of wisdom from our father. Let's go with it. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him, for the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. Now, who did this? Who accomplished this? God did. Do you think God can't change the minds of people? Do you know that... Um, God, in this case, would change the mind of Sihon to, to, to basically uh, force Moses to do what he had told him to in the first place. 
In other words, to prove his snuff, I'll use an old Southern term, that um, he was willing to obey God because God wanted this nest to be cleansed. And therefore, he himself hardened the mind of this individual. What happened then, 31? And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land before thee, began to possess that thou mayest inherit his land. Again, he had driven Moab out. This way, it's a little bit ironic. Israel will have the land, but Moab will have no hard feelings because he lost it to Sihon. So God has a way of working things that you have to look behind the scene. Does he do that in your own life? Sometimes there are things happen with God's election that they may not understand at all, but you need to look deeper. And it isn't that God sends bad things upon you, but he can change the minds of certain people. And that can ultimately lead to what you might think is bad, but ultimately very positive. Verse 32. Then Sihon came out against us, he and all his people, to fight at Jahaz. Jahaz meaning trodden down, and boy, is it about to happen to it. 33. And the Lord our God delivered him before us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. 34, again, like I said, a little tough for Christians, but listen. And we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. And again, unless you understand the very deceptive evil works that Satan placed on beginning with Genesis 6 up to this time with the Nephinim you would never understand that. There was only one way to cleanse it. 35. Only the cattle we took for a prey unto ourselves and the spoil of the cities which we took. I just want to I feel led to just insert a quick word here. Never forget God is the God of the living. And God is just, even with these people that were uh, destroyed at this time. You never know what God did with those souls which returned instantly to him. So think a little deeper than what you might normally in that situation. Verse 36. From Aurora, which is by the brink of the river of Arnon, and from the city that is by the river, even into Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. Why? The Lord our God delivered all unto us. <clears throat> when God is with you, no one can be against you. You have the victory. This is why that it's important, very important, that you absorb the promises God makes to his children. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's just the same as the commandment, the first commandment of promise, honor your mother and your father, and you will have a long, successful life, happy life. That's a promise, and you can claim that. And I know that many times parents can be abusive, but at the same time you can appreciate them and honor them for the fact they brought you into the world, period. All right. So. Know those promises. They're important. They're real. It's not religion. It's a reality. Verse 37. Only unto the land of the children of Ammon, this would be uh, the offspring of Lot, thou camest not, nor into any place of the river uh, Jebak, nor into the cities in the mountains, nor unto whatsoever the Lord our God forbade us. What do you get from that? They obeyed God. That's important. That's the reason God was with them. They obeyed him. Sometimes you might decide, well, hey, I can take a little shortcut here. I, God probably doesn't realize that um, as intelligent as I am, I can do this a little better than he has. I'm going to take a little shortcut. You, you cut yourself off from God right there, right that instant. You want to be very careful in understanding your father's word and uh, doing things that are contrary to 
his word. Chapter 3, same subject, verse 1, let's go with it. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og, the, or Og, if you prefer, the king of Bashan came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edrei. Now, old Og is the last of the genuine giants. Uh, he's a whopper. You're going to find out uh, here before long. We're going to find out how big his bed was. And, uh, uh, but he was the last of what in the Hebrew tongue would be called the long necks. And, but he was a giant indeed. But Moses knew, and the people by this time, if God gives someone into your hand, it doesn't matter. And of course, little David would set the example anyway that, uh, and I would say to you in this generation, anytime you think that there are giants out there that are going to prohibit you from serving God, you're mistaken. There are no giants before God's children. And you never have to fear. God gives us power, that's his promise, through the Son over all our enemies. But you've got to do it his way, all right? So uh, here we have the last of the big boys, giants, genuine. And uh, let's continue with the next verse then, too. And the Lord said unto me, Fear not him. For I will deliver him and all his people and all his land into thy hand, and thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. In other words, what this is doing is clearing the upper lands uh, joining uh, Nebo, Mount Nebo, and the northern part of the Dead Sea, where, which is some very fertile land, some of the very best, Needless to say, that's why the giant would have settled there. Lots of groceries, verse 3. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands old also the king of Bashan and all his people, and we smote him until none was left to him remaining. The second influx um, of the Nethanim, basically, I'm sorry, the Nephilim, uh, basically gone. Verse 4. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities. That's 60 of them. All the region of Argob, meaning stony, the kingdom of Og and Bashan. Um, so um, stony, wrong rock though, friend. God had to, that's the reason for the flood, this would complete what the flood did not do, the second influx, verse 5. All these, and I'm speaking second influx of fallen angels, verse 5. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars beside unwalled towns a great many. Hey, that'd be pretty scary, wouldn't it? That's kind of the story that some of the spies brought back about the great walled cities, impossible to take them, and they've got giants in that land. Yeah. But it didn't matter. When God gives you a thing, you know what God will do with the great walls when uh, Joshua will take over uh, Israel at the end of Moses' uh, uh, tenure here, he'll make those walls just sink into the ground. No walls to it. Verse 6, And we utterly destroyed them as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. 7, But all the cattle and the spoil of the cities we took for a prey to ourselves. They're becoming wealthy, so to speak, taking the wealthy land, good land. Reuben and, and uh, Gad will end up with that particular property as their home. Verse 8, And we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on this side, Jordan, that would be the east side, that's where they were at the time of this writing, from the river of Arnon, or the plain of Arnon, you might say, unto Mount Hermon. Verse 9, which Herman the Sidonians 
called Sirion, uh, and the Amorites call it Shinir. And Sirion means coat of mail, and I, no one knows for sure what Shinir means, but I would say it means the same thing, only in a different tongue. Verse 10, all the cities of the plain and all Gilad and all Bashan unto Salka and Edria, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. They took them. Now let's learn a little about Og here. Verse 11, for only Og, king of Bashan, uh, remained of the remnant of giants. He's the last partner. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Do they not have it there kind of in a museum? Nine cupids was the length thereof, and four cupids the breadth of it after the cupid of a man. Well, a cupid of a man is however long the king's arm is from the elbow to the tips of his fingers, usually falling about 18 and a half inches, which would, um, uh, which would make this dude, his bed, about 18 feet long. 18 feet long and about eight foot, four inches or so, a hand's breadth wide. Now, naturally, that doesn't mean he was that tall, but it took a bed that big for he to be comfortable in. And um, talk about a king-size bed. Now, that would be a genuine king-size bed. Many people doubt, you know, unbelievers doubt there were giants. But this is why God had to destroy them, because it was not a natural thing in as much as he had created man in the flesh and only animals having been in the flesh prior to that but he created we flesh people in the exact image we were in our spiritual bodies the same food and so forth uh, that is to say angels food will sustain the flesh body and this was a cohabitation of the fallen ones who saw that the daughters of Adam were beautiful to look upon, so rather than to be born to woman innocent, as each soul must do, it's called born from above. I know a lot of Christians in ignorance say, born again, I'm a born again Christian. Not, the Greek is very specific in John 3. Born from above, meaning your spirit came from God. So in these um, Nephilim, God's... Uh, enemies, that is to say those that the lieutenants of Satan, though they were his children, they followed Satan and they were trying to destroy the, perf the woman through whom Christ would come. And not to mention that, but with all that um, advanced knowledge released to people that don't remember the first earth age, what happened there, and so forth, it would stir the pot very much as to people having a perfect, honest, innocent opportunity to love God or Satan. Okay, so that's, I'm, I mean, I'm saying that so that you know why God destroyed those um, hybrids. That's what they were. And um, verse 12, and this land which we possessed at that time from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, and half of Mount, half Mount Gilad, and the cities thereof gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites. That'd be the tribe of Gad and the tribe of Reuben, Reuben being the older of the 12, 13. And the rest of Gilad and all Bashan being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh all the re reign of, uh, region rather, of Argab, Gob, and all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants. And so it was. Now, in verse 14, Jair, who means the enlighten enlightener, uh, the son of Manasseh, took all the country of Argob unto the coast of Geshua, 
and Maachathai and called them by his own name. I guess he was proud of it, the Enlightener. Must have been pretty proud of himself too. And he called it Beshan Havot Jar unto this day. Now, do you know what that means? Well, they, they told you, but let's, let's uh, of course, Bishan is the name of the town. Hevat means the village, or the towns, probably better said, of Jair. So what did it say? The, the uh, Bashan villages of Jair, they belong to me. So he was probably pretty proud of himself. Again, Bashan being the geographical location, Hevat, my towns, Jair. 15. And I, and I gave Gilad unto, unto uh, Maker. This is interesting because Maker means sold. And there's a little story to his background. I choose, I think we won't go into it at this moment. 16. And unto the Reubenites and unto the Gadites I gave from Gilad even unto the river Arnon, half the valley and the border even unto the river Javak which is the border of the children of Ammon. In other words, uh, letting the brothers border each other, but not infringing upon the rights of those that had uh, conquered this. Now, some might say, well, why would, why would God give Lot's sons, which really weren't of the 12, that land? I can tell you, because they went in and fought for it where the others went to the bushes and hid for 40 years. God used those two to cleanse the giants out with the exception of this one. Therefore, God said, don't you touch their land. They earned it. God appreciates can-do type people. I guarantee you he does. He will bless a can-do type person um, wonderfully. Verse 17. The plain also and Jordan and the coast thereof from uh, uh, Kinnere, Kinnereth, uh, even unto the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, under Ashdospiska, eastward. Now, Kinnereth, you know by a different name. You know it by Genesaret a uh, place that Jesus would have quite a bit to do with. And it's called, it's, um, it, um, because of its shape, kina, harp, it was shaped like a harp. And that's what it means. That's why it's name, it draws its name. It would look like the shape of the, the um, place would look like a harp. Verse 18. And I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God hath given you this land to possess it. Ye shall pass over armed before your brethren, the children of Israel, all that are meet for the war. In other words, I'm giving this to Reuben and I'm giving it to Gad, but you're going to be the shock troops that are going to cross that river because you're, you're already home. But he's going to allow them. I believe it'll be in the next verse. Yes, 19. But your wives and your little ones and your cattle, for I know that you have much cattle, shall abide in your cities which I have given you. Turning all this over to them, but saying, because I give you this first, you're going to earn it by crossing the Jordan and being the shock troops or the advanced troops to win the rest of the land. Verse 20, Un until the Lord hath given rest unto your brethren, in the word they've got peace, as well as unto you, and, unto they also un and until they also possess the land which the Lord your God hath given them beyond Jordan, on the other side. What side? The west side. And then shall you return every man unto his possession which I have given you. I think there is a lesson in life within that, that, you know, I like to look at the emotions of God because God never changes. And when you understand his emotions, you know better how to please him, thus bringing blessings into your own self and family. 
Um, in this, uh, some might have murmured a little bit about, well, uh, hey, I've got mine, let them go get theirs. So if God seems to lead you in a way that you don't quite understand sometimes, be very cautious, analyze. In other words, these had to help, in other words, those to this time all had fought to help them gain their land. Had people started dropping out, you would not have had the full army to take the rest of the land until probably the last few tribes would have been destroyed by, by uh, number. So what am I saying? A family must work together. That's why that Christ says you're one body because the many-membered body can accomplish many things. Oh, you'll have a few spark plugs here and there, but it takes a spark plug to get things done. That's what fires the gas that drives the engine, all right? Be that as it may, but even God controls the spark plug. But what is my point? Well, I suppose that you should be gentr generous spiritually thinking about our family and what you do for it, with it, within it, and to it. That God in this, do you see how he reasoned this out where it's perfectly fair? So that should, my point being, you should trust God's plan to be totally fair to all parties involved. And this is wonderful when it is such because it makes it fair for everyone and no one has any right to complain. And um, I, I, I draw quite a bit from that, that Father very wisely, naturally, um, managed to keep all the body together until there was rest. And of course, in the long plan, Christ is our rest. So when we keep the whole body in Christ, we find that rest. But inasmuch as Christ is the living word, you cannot find that rest without finding that word. Verse 21, and I commanded, um, was that the, yeah, 21. And I commanded Joshua, th this word means, as we would say in the English, Jesus, all right, Yeshua. At that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passeth. He's going to do that. He's going to give you the land. Remember Jericho? Okay, verse 20. That, that's the first town Joshua will be given. 22. Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. That's why you can be very bold in claiming the promises of God. Why? God's going to ensure that you have whatever it is that uh, the promise pertains to. Verse 23, uh, I suppose there are exceptions to everything, but they would be rare in that case. 23 reads, And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, 24, O Lord God, Thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness. I mean, that's, and you could see it. And thy mighty hand, for what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might. There, of course, there is none. Um, most little gods are a stick or a chunk of rock or something somebody's whittled or molded or a bunch of nonsense. There is only one God, and he is the eternal. You know, I can understand what Moses is about to do here. You see, all this beautiful land was there for the taking, and God was giving it, and Moses already knows that God's not going to let him see it, or is not going to let him cross that river. So he knows his days are numbered. And he's beseeching God here, playing on his emotions even a little bit. I think you could detect that from the way, oh, Lord God, you know, you're great, you're wonderful. Verse 25, I pray thee, 
let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon, Lebanon being that white mountain over there. I want to see it. 26, but the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes. You're the, kind of, well, he, he doesn't let him off the hook. You're the ones that caused it. For your sakes, when he struck the rock twice, of course, and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, you better listen real carefully, friend. The Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. God had already kind of told him in a time or two, and this was it. So you kind of want to remember, as we've learned so far in this book of Deuteronomy, many of them waited one day too late. That is to say, to do it God's way. And then after God withdrew from them, then they said, we've sinned. And they saddled up and rode off and got a bunch of themselves killed. Just can't work with God. Well, see that you do. But when God, through his promises and through his word, declares the thing, and when it is emphasized, as an emphasis can almost be a warning, my friend, and God did emphasize this, suffice thee, speak no more about this. What he was really saying, son, you ain't going. Because that would be like, you understand the spiritual uh, meaning of this is that Christ would have had to have been crucified twice because Christ is our rock. And striking once was sufficient. Verse 27, from that the living water. Verse 27 reads, Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward and northward, and southward and eastward, and behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. You're not going, boy. But do you see what he did? The top of Pisgah is the highest peak of Mount Nebo. And from there he could see the promised land. Now, God certainly loved this one. He'll let no one else bury him. He simply takes him. I have my own opinions. Let's go two more verses to finish the chapter. But charge Joshua, and this is a type of Jesus, Savior, because of the name, all right? You can't miss on that. And encourage him and strengthen him for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which they shall see. He will take them into the promised land. To complete 29, so we abode in the valley over against Beth Peor. Beth, of course, being house in the Hebrew tongue, and Peor being a cliff or a bluff. That's where they hung out there at the base, you might say, of... Uh, of Nebo. Our father has a set plan, and I hope if there's any one thing you notice, it is not often that he deviates from that, and if he does, it was probably part of the plan from the beginning. So be very cautious when you deviate from God's word. You're headed for trouble. And if you learn any one thing from this, being it is a reading of the law, the commandments of God, and a letter, a, a letter insisting on obedience, then let it be obedience that comes from you in mind toward your father, and you will find peace of mind. God singles out people like that, and really, he doesn't show preferential treatment. It's just that he loves them, and they earn it. And when you, if someone earns something, that's not preferential. That's fair. So if it seems like God's a little fairer to some than others, don't worry, he's not. They earned it. That is to say, with blessings.